thanks for joining us for the premiere episode of An Hour in the Buff. We're your hosts, John Woods and Adam Munster Tiger. Thanks for joining us for the first ever episode of our new YouTube show. Adam, how's it going today? It's going great, but when we collaborated and, and, and came to the idea of creating this show, I never would have imagined we'd be talking about an 0-2 football team. I agree, I agree. We, uh, I personally had hopes of somehow sneaking out 2-1, maybe even a 3-0 start. The schedule worked out really, really well for the Buffs this year. It, it just didn't happen early. We had a missed fourth down uh, against Colorado State. We had muff pump punts. We had a, a last second drive with pass interference calls against Sacramento State. Everyone knows the program is hurting a little bit after these first two games, but what's kind of the overall state of the program? Where do things stand now? Well, it's, it's a desperation mode. They need to get a, a win, and uh, we, know, we all know about their road woes, which they you know, were able to snap that road losing streak in, in Utah. But instead of now having that road losing streak hanging over their heads going out to Fresno State, they've got this 0-2 start hanging over their heads. So um, they're kind of going into bunker mentality up there in Boulder. Um, that's what John Embry said during his press conference today. He used the word hunker down. And so that's you know, really all they can do at this point is keep working and, and trying to uh, eliminate the distractions and, and put blinders on because obviously there's a lot of negativity about this football program right now. And for these players and coaches to be letting that, to absorb that is not going to help them in, in any way. Absolutely. And I think um, there's a lot of negatives we can go into about the first two games, but for the sake of uh, starting the show off on a good note, why don't we talk about one of the biggest positives we had from last Saturday, and that's Christian Powell. He's a uh, true freshman fullback from up Upland, only got one carry in the first game and busts out of nowhere in the second game for 150-something yards. Um, what happened there? What changed the coach's mentality um, to give him more carries? and, and where is his role heading into game three against Fresno State? Well, in the opener, they, they couldn't manage anything on the ground. And so it, they, they went to the drawing board and said, what can we do here? And, and ever since this staff took over, they've been trying to create this smash mouth mentality. Well, you've got a six foot one, 200, I should say six foot, 235 pound true freshman that, you know, he didn't get a lot of carries in high school. He was a fullback to Dante Abron, who's actually a tailback at CU, a freshman as well. Um, but he did gain 10 yards a carry as a senior. Um, what's crazy about it is he had 40 carries as a senior at Upland and he had 28 carries last, just last Saturday, which, uh, yeah. And so in, in the press conference today, um, Christian Powell was talking to the media and he, he kind of joked about, he knew he was going to be part of the game plan but had no idea. And on his second carry, had a 64 yard touchdown. And uh, when you have an offense that's struggling to move the ball through the air, and you got a running back that's, that's producing, you're going to keep going back to him. And I don't think long-term 20, 28 carries for Christian Powell is going to be the answer. That's too much, especially for a bruising back that is carrying bodies with him you know, to gain an extra two yards every time he carries the football. I mean, there were many, many carries were, uh, during the game where he was three yards deep and had guys uh, from Sacramento State jumping on his back, and he got another two or three yards. So long-term, I think he's going to be more of a 10 to 15 carry uh, type back. Um, but John Embry says his future is at tailback. He's going to stay there. So it'll be interesting to see um, how they complement him going forward. Well, I know up in the box, no cheering, can't yell. But that was one of the few times where I, I had to hold in an audible little yell there when you see this, this big, huge, hulking fullback go 64 yards for a touchdown. And, of course, at that point, that was to give CU a very quick lead. Things looked great. Um, and I had to hold one back to not let And, so, and somebody didn't there. hold back. Yeah. Somebody got yelled <laughs> at in the press box. So. Yeah. And, yeah. and we'll, we'll talk about this little concept a little bit more later. But is we saw how good he can be as a tailback. But can he also add value in that fullback role blocking for another tailback, maybe somebody that's shifty and fast? How do we get our best players on the field as we go forward? Um, but there was an improvement when you look at the Colorado State game and then you look at Sacramento State, there was a difference in the offensive line. Uh, we had two injuries during the game. You had Alex Lewis go down for a bit and come back. And we also had Gus Handler go down, and he was replaced by Daniel Munyer. What's, uh, what's Gus Handler's status going into Saturday, and will we expect to see Munyer out there again? And if so, will that affect the offensive line? You'll definitely see Daniel Munyer out there. He's starting right guard if Gus Handler's ready to go. And Gus Handler's situation is up in the air. Embry said yesterday it's 50-50. Um, and so if Gus Handler can't go, what you're going to see happen is Daniel Munyer moving to center. You're going to see um, Ryan Danowitz inserted into the game. He's kind of their, their sixth man, if you will, a very versatile player that can play a lot of positions. And 
what he allows you to do is when there's an injury, you can shuffle guys around and you still have your six be or you, your five best offensive linemen out there. So if Gus Handler can't go, Munyer will slide into center and you'll see uh, Ryan Danowitz out there. So now we got a taste of, of what that line would look like in the second half of the Sacramento State game. Uh, there was kind of a lull there for CU in the, uh, near, towards the end of the first half. What differences did you see between the line with Gus Handler in there and the line with Daniel Munner and Ryan Danowitz in there? I didn't see a big difference, and it goes back to the fact that they've been practicing with Ryan, Ryan Danowitz as the sixth piece, and so it's something that they've been prepared for. You're not going to go through an entire 12-game college football season without one injury in that old line, so it was only a matter of time when he was going to get put in there. I didn't see, you know, as bad as the offensive line played against Colorado State, I don't think that was necessarily their issue against Sacramento State. So we'll get into, the, everyone already knows at this point about the uh, John Embry's announcement that Jordan Webb will be the starter against Fresno State, but Connor Wood will see some snaps at some point. And we'll, move, we'll talk about the whole quarterback rotation thing here in just a little bit, but talk about the passing game. We've seen two games of Jordan Webb, we've seen two games of Tyler McCulloch and Nelson Spruce in the receiving core. What's going wrong there? Um, and is it something that's a problem with Jordan Webb? Is it something with the receivers? Or is it a combination of, of all those things? Well, here's the problem. Obviously, it takes 11 guys to be on the same page on the football field. Well, what's happening is some plays, the receivers are not getting separation. Some plays they are, and Jordan Webb is not putting the ball in the money. Sometimes the offensive line isn't protecting properly. And so what you have there is kind of this hodgepodge of reasons why it's not, why it's not getting done. And so what they need is, is bottom line is more consistency out of those three units. They don't have a lot of speed at receiver. We've seen Gerald Thomas, the true freshman, make some plays. And uh, you know the offensive line, if they continue to improve, we saw some improvement, like I said earlier, from week one to week two. If they can do that, then it comes down to quarterback play and, and being able to be more accurate with the ball. And John Embry said at his press conference today that Jordan Webb needs to be more consistent. And, you know, he said he wants to see the Jordan Webb that won the job during camp on game day, and we haven't seen that so far. Well, that's a common theme we've heard so far. It's, it's kind of the, uh, the theme that fans are sticking and, and holding on to from the press conferences from Embry so far is that we're, they're not playing like they're practicing. They're not playing like, like we're practicing. Uh, and and I, I hope that that doesn't become a, a Dan Hawkins type refrain that we hear over and over again because we've seen how that goes, but it, it's true to a point that the only way to find out how a guy is going to perform in the game is to either put him in there or go by how he practices. Uh, I, I hope whatever quarterback that we go with on Saturday, that one of them can shine, one of them can look like the stronger quarterback so that they can move forward with a starter, be it Connor Wood, be it Jordan Webb, so that we're not doing the shuffle more than Saturday at Fresno State. I don't, don't feel like that's going to be beneficial to the team, as we've seen over numerous, numerous examples over time. Uh, Moving, moving on a little bit to the defense, uh, it's been an up and down to be very positive type performance. We've got a lot of youth on the defense, but you and I were talking a little bit earlier about the comment Embry made about Will Precheck maybe sliding over to the defensive end role to allow some of the younger guys at defensive tackle to get some more playing time. We kind of went back and forth, is that a plus, is that a negative? But talk a little bit about first, why are they doing that? What's the uh, impetus behind moving Precheck from his strength to a position he hasn't really played before? The, the bottom line is they have more depth, quality depth, at defensive tackle. Um, Judah Parker has not come along the way they wanted to. Him too, he played uh, as a true freshman last year, but has not gone that next step to being a consistent playmaker. Um, they started Kirk Poston uh, against Colorado State. He did some good things, but their thinking was, we'll move Will Precheck to defensive end, and we'll be able to get these young interior defensive linemen more experience. Um, they have Justin Solis, Tyler Hennington, and Josh T Topu, uh, three true freshmen, along with Nate Bonzu, a veteran at defensive tackle. So right there you have four guys that you want to get quality reps to. Well, with Will Precheck in there, that just makes that group more crowded. Now, is Will Precheck better suited to be inside? Probably, but this is a good athlete. In high school, he went to Boulder High School. Uh, he played as a tight end, as a linebacker. Actually was recruited to CU as a, as, a, uh, as a tight end. So he's a good athlete. So he's not this big, stiff 330 pounder. Obviously, you're not going to move Josh Topu to, to defensive end, but Will Precheck is the type of athlete that can make that move. And as someone who's been all off season long, all season long, I'm excited about getting the young guys' experience. I'm excited about freshmen seeing the field, getting that playing time. But 
you know I'm a big college fo football fan of, of all college football, and you are as well. When you hear when you hear a coach, even if it's, that's not his quote, when you hear a coach say, "We want to get these guys more experience," as a true freshman, you usually think, "Oh, that's a uh, that's coming in at the fourth quarter of a blowout, or coming in against a D two school or FCS school when the game's already out of hand." Then we're getting the experience, but we're talking about getting true freshman experience in a must-win game. Is that just kind of the nature of the CU program right now and of this season? Yeah, when you have eight seniors, <laughs> you don't have that luxury to do that. So yeah, th I mean, everybody knew coming into the season that, that was gonna be an issue. And you know, by and large, now there were the, the pass interference calls late in the Sacramento State game, and both of those flags were on true freshmen. But by and large, I don't feel like the true freshmen are necessarily the reason that they've lost these two games. So at the end of the day, if, if they're your best athletes, as Embry has said, tie goes to youth. So they're going to try to play those youngsters. And I mean, you're 0-2 at this point. What do you have to lose, right? I mean, get those guys out there, get them experience, and let them grow. And that's, that's going to be the plan for this, this program. It was going in, and even more so now. identify, I think, a few things that we can keep doing to improve. Um, you know, we're going to keep being competitive. We're going to keep uh, grinding and fighting. You know, as I said in my press conference afterwards, that's who I am as a person, and that's what my staff is comprised of, a lot of competitors, a lot of guys who will fight. And, uh, you know, we're spreading that attitude to the team. Uh, the players were great in the meetings. Uh, we talked about details. You know, is some of the issues that has arisen that has kept us from winning, some details and uh, how we can fix it as coaches and as players. And uh, so we showed some video and talked about some other stuff that, that pertains to that. And I think that uh, uh, they understand that now. And, and the way they went out there and practiced and some of the things they did yesterday shows me that uh, they're still willing to compete and fight. So we're looking forward to going to uh, Fresno and uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, Christian was a guy, you know, when we were recruiting him, he, he showed some ability as a tailback. We felt, uh, you know, could, be, you know, maybe uh, be a guy eventually might be a tailback uh, or had, you know, that skill set. And then when we uh, were able to uh, um, have this opportunity arise this past week, putting him in there, he, he obviously did a very good job. Uh, he left a lot of yards out there, you know, and that's just from inexperience, you know, and some things with his footwork, which Eric is getting him corrected on. And, you know, he's a guy when there was two yards there, he was getting five and six. And that's what, you you know, you like as a back, so it doesn't always have to be blocked perfectly. Uh, so, um, you know, we'll go with him again this week and, you know, see how, you know, if he can continue to uh, build on what he did last week. What made us keep believing? <laughs> Uh, there was a lot of guys a lot like me. I just, I just refuse to not. So, uh, you know, we had Eric Coyle, Barry Remington, um, Steve Beck, Darren Schubeck, Solomon Wilcox. Um, you know, we, we refuse to not believe. You know, uh, lost some heartbreaking games. We lost to Oregon, I think, by one. Ohio State by three. Arizona by four, and then the CSU where we had all the tournament we lost, I think, by 13. Uh, but never wavered, you know. Um, and I, I shared with the team a little bit because I know they're getting a lot of flack uh, on campus or wherever, and, and it, that doesn't change. It, it was happening back in 1986, you know. That's part of, what, part of the deal. But... Um, you know, our mindset was it's going to break, and it did. And the same people that booed us and was calling us names were tearing down the goalposts on October 20th. <laughs> well, when you're talking about true freshmen, uh, you're always going to have a little bit more of that he's the new guy excitement. But really, when you look at the season, all things considered, almost all the positive highlight type plays and, and the excitement that's come out of the both losses, they've come from the true freshmen. I mean, you've seen big plays. There's certainly been upperclassmen making plays. But when you add that new guy excitement and the new guy talent on top of some of the plays guys like Christian Powell and Gerald Thomas have made on offense, there is going to be uh, an excitement around those guys. We've got to start 
getting a getting a win in the in the win column to, to get people to really understand that uh, what, where we're moving forward with the season. Um, moving back a step with the linebackers, we've had uh, kind of a different rotation that we have planned. You have injuries to Doug Rippey that, that have kept him out of some games, slowed him a little bit in some of the games, and then you've had a uh, Brady Day come in and really, really look good so far and see a lot of playing time with John Major and Derek Webb in different situations. How's the linebacking uh, unit shaping up so far and, and what's Day done so well to get so much playing time? Well, he's been consistent. Uh, we talked about that earlier on offense being the issue. Um, obviously, preseason camp was close to the media, close to the public. So we had to kind of base you know, who was performing well off coaches' comments. And, and uh, you know, Brady Day was one of the guys over and over again, was somebody that John Embry was mentioning. Uh, he came in from Denver Mullen High School. I, I followed his high school career closely. Just a prototypical middle linebacker. He's going to do what he does well, and that's, uh, you know, clog the run and, and basically clog the middle of the field. And so he's done a good job of that. And uh, you didn't mention Derek Webb, who has been spectacular this season. He was more of a special team superstar as an underclassman. And he's really taken the next step, especially in the Colorado State game. I mean, that's one of the best games by a linebacker I've seen at CU in a while. And he actually called a players-only meeting yesterday. So it's clear that he's a leader on this team. And you're going to see a lot of will backers uh, on the field against Fresno State that's going to try to spread you out a little bit this Saturday. You're going to see a heavy dose of Kyle Washington and Derek Webb. You're going to see some Paul Vigo who moved from safety to will linebacker. And the reason that they moved some of those safeties to linebacker was for games like this, for games against Oregon, when you've got teams that are trying to spread you out. So they have more speed at linebacker. It'll be interesting to see how those guys do this Saturday. And then with the injuries, you mentioned, we mentioned Rippey, uh, Ray Polk, how long's he out? Still up in the air. You know, he's got the dreaded high ankle sprain and you can't come back too quick because if you do, you're gonna re-injure it. It's almost a guarantee. It's one of those injuries that just lingers and there's no rush in it. It's kind of like a hamstring. You, you just gotta, you gotta rest it. Um, I've had people tell me it's almost better to break your ankle than to have a high ankle sprain because, and so we, we really don't know. He's, he's definitely out this Saturday. Um, if he comes back within the next couple weeks, that would be a quick recovery for that type of injury. As bad as, bad as uh, an injury as that was. As a guy who is has the leader of the secondary, especially when you look at a secondary that's so extremely young, you have to assume that that role has been kind of passed on to, on the field at least, to Parker Arms. Is he the guy that's kind of calling the calling the shots out there in the secondary right now, or is that uh, something that, that Ray Polk's still doing as much as possible from the sidelines? It's well, it's tough when you're on the sideline and there's 50,000 <laughs> fans screaming. In practice, certainly, uh, you know, certainly Ray Polk is taking on a mentorship role, but it, it's really between Parker Orms and Terrell Smith, both guys that are in their junior season that have played some, but are not as experienced as Ray Polk, so. Um, I don't want to say the communication's been bad back there, but it would certainly be better with Ray Polk back yeah, there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's suffered a bit, uh, at least. Um, well, we've got, we had Gary Wright and Kenneth Crawley, the true, 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 true freshman start uh, against Sacramento State. Is that the same lineup we're going to see against Fresno State, or should we expect Greg Henderson to be back? Greg Henderson, same boat. We were talking about Gus Handler earlier. He's 50-50 for this game. Now he's got a hot, uh, a low high or high low ankle sprain. It's not, what are, it, it's not uh, just a low, it, it's some uh, different combination of the two. And so it's not quite as bad as Ray Polk. Um, so if we don't see him back this Saturday, I would envision him coming back the following week at Washington State. Okay. So there was, you mentioned the press conference a couple of times already. Let's, there was a couple of high notes uh, or notable things, I would say, that came out of the press conference. One being we had actually a lot of readers on our site, and I'm sure yours as well, ask, Asked what happened to Embry's Twitter account. Um, I know he made a comment about he used to, use it to talk to recruits, and after last week, he didn't feel it was necessary. What was the story behind him kind of suddenly getting rid of the Twitter account? He said he had received some irresponsible uh, tweets and following the game, and so I think to try to lim uh, limit distractions. Um, I, I mean, I guess there's really not much to be gained when people are hitting your account and. and um, saying things that are disrespectful, so I, I don't think many people can blame him for doing that. Um, he was having fun with it. You know, we, we, we all saw the riddle. Uh, the, he, we were all trying to figure out it, and I think most of us got it when they were announcing the quarterback. And for big verbal commitments, he used to, you know, do the Here Comes Ralphie tweets. Yeah. So we won't see that going forward. Uh, 
But you know, he didn't say whether this is permanent or temporary. He just said that he had received some uh, irresponsible tweets and, and decided to make that uh, change. Well, and I don't know what irresponsible is. I mean, I'm sure I can imagine some of the venom that was being sent his way after that game. If you're tweeting something that ridiculous at a head coach, you should find a new hobby. There's no reason to be, to be doing yeah. something so ridiculous. I mean, he's a person. You wouldn't say it to his face. It's a shame that we have to lose that account because you're right. He did have... He seemed to be getting used to it and having some fun with it uh, as, as we went on. Hopefully that'll be something that we can bring back. I think the other big kind of announcement that was made uh, with the press conference and previously was the, was the quarterback rotation. We, we talked about it a second ago, but there's going to be some sort of a quarterback rotation after they said during the preseason and during fall camp there may be a rotation and pretty quickly reverse course and named Jordan Webb the starter. Now we're two games, two losses, uh, a so-so and a, a Four-ish, uh, four-ish, four performance from Jordan Webb in the second game. We're, we're now back to Connor Wood may see a couple series near the beginning of the game when they're not backed up on the end zone. What's kind of the story there? How do you how do you personally feel about a quarterback rotation and and the quarterbacks going into the game Saturday against Fresno State? Well, yeah, just going back to the beginning when they named Jordan Webb the starter, it was because he was a lot better during camp. Uh, they wouldn't have named him so early during during camp if it was. A close competition. He ran away with it, but obviously it has not translated to Saturday. And so you have Connor Wood, this intriguing player on your team who was not as consistent in practice. That's why he did not win the job. We all know that, but we don't know what Connor Wood could bring to the table on Saturday. It's a great unknown. Um, I talked with quarterbacks coach Rip Scherer after practice on Monday. He said this has nothing to do with Jordan Webb's performance. I don't believe him. Yeah, it's <laughs> He also made the comment that you, you really don't know until you put a, a, a guy out there on game day whether he's going to shrink in the lights or the opposite and perform really well. And so I think that's, you know, we have a pretty good pulse on Colorado fans. Yeah. Be, and they just want to see Connor Wood because there's this great unknown, like I said. They, they want to see what he can do. And so whether it's the third or fourth series, it sounds like he's going to get into the game early on Saturday, and we'll see. Um, they're, they're not very definitive in it, and I think that's by plan because how do you know going into the game how it's going to go? If Jordan Webb can't move the football and Connor Wood comes in and moves him right down the field, how do you not put him back in? So uh, if, if anything else, I know Colorado fans are super frustrated, but at least there's some intrigue for this football it's true. game. It's true. I'm excited to see it. I've always, uh, I've always been excited to see him play uh, ever since he transferred from Texas. And you've certainly been covering the Buffaloes longer than I have, and you're much, much closer to the team. And this is putting you on the spot, but you always hear this. Obviously, there's people that practice better than others, and there's obviously people that step up in games better than others. Is there a guy that you can think of uh, in Colorado's history that, that traditionally or, or got a lot of, not bad reviews, but he's not up to speed on, in practice, but would consistently perform in games? Is there anyone you can think of that was just better once the lights were on? Tyler Hansen was a better player in games than he was in practice. He, he got better at that. When uh, going into his senior year, that, in that camp leading up to senior year, he was really good in practice. But um, that, that was another thing that frustrated fans because the former coaching staff would chart everything the quarterbacks did during practice. And, of course, they had Cody Hawkins, who was very accurate um, and very good in certain things that would be really exploited during practice yeah. and maybe not necessarily during a game so that's one guy but yeah I mean there, there are guys that when the lights come on you know they, they bring it and, and vice versa and again until you actually put them out there and see yeah. what they can do you don't know what you have uh, I go back to what I just said I said earlier in the show is I hope that one of them whoever it may be I, I may have personal favorites but whoever it may be I hope that one guy steps up plays, plays well and can be named that starter as we go forward We are here at the Blake Street Tavern with Chris Fuselet, the owner of this fine establishment. Chris, thanks for letting us come here to shoot our premiere episode. I really appreciate it. Oh, glad to have you guys down here. So before we get into anything else, let's uh, talk a little bit about the watch party you're going to put on here on Saturday. It sounds like it's going to be a good time. Uh, what, what all is going to happen on Saturday here at the Blake We're Street Tavern? We're going to have the, uh, the biggest watch party in CU history. Um, it's going to be under the stars. It's something unique. Um, we're going to rent a 26-foot widescreen TV um, and put in our parking lot. It's like you know, like a drive-in movie theater. 
and uh, we've got our parking lot entirely permitted. We'll have beer out there. We'll be grilling brats and hot dogs, and we'll have a special guest from uh, no, no other than Ralph. In the wow. So. I don't know if there's a, a bar owner in this town that supports CU more than you. Uh, we were talking before we came on air here, and you said your first year at CU as a student was Bill McCartney's first year? That's right. That's right. That's when we were in those blue unis. And uh, I'd be one of the guys that uh, was actually standing at the end of the game, whereas uh, I think the whole fraternity was uh, passed out drunk at the fraternity house at halftime. And so you saw them in, in tough times and saw them develop into a national powerhouse and now again they're obviously struggling. Uh, how hard has that been for you to, to watch this team struggle recently? You know it really seems like history repeats itself and um, I was actually talking to Coach Mack the other day and um, he's like you know what it's you know times are tough but we got to stand shoulder to shoulder and um, you know we're gonna bounce back. It's just I, you know, you hate hearing excuses, but gosh darn it, I mean, the entire team is freshmen and sophomores for all essential purposes. And we got to remember that. And, um, you know, we got to hang in there. And um, it's tough because when you've tasted, you know, victories like we all have and national championship, uh, you like to always maintain that consistency. But, um, you know, if you really think about it, there's only a handful of programs that have been able to do that year after year. And, um, Look at Washington, they were all in 12, what, three years ago? And look where they've done, you know? So I know we can bounce back. Now one program that's not struggling is the Tad Boyle men's basketball program. I, I've seen you sitting there at courtside of games and uh, have you ever seen CU, as much excitement about you know, CU basketball as there is right now? I tell you what, um, <laughs> I hate to admit this, but after the CU, CU loss, I looked up under the, uh, the website and said, when's the men's basketball first home game? Was that November 11th? Yeah. Uh, I am so excited about the Hoops program. And it, it's just so great. Uh, uh, I am fortunate enough to have courtside seats, and uh, I cannot wait for Midnight Madness and to see the, uh, the, these uh, young recruits come in, the, the kids from Colorado Springs. Um, Josh Scott just tearing up on the floor. Um, I, I think um, it's great. Why can't CU should be like Stanford, should be like Florida, should be like Ohio State. We should have both a good football program and a good basketball program. Now you have the watch party this Saturday. What other events here at the Blake Street Tavern can, can fans look forward to? Is it every road game? Do you, do you throw an uh, event yeah. here? Well, we're the official uh, home of the uh, CU Young alums, the Denver Buff Club, uh, the C Club. So um, we've done, and we've been that way for the last nine years. So. You know, next to my kids and wife, uh, CU is my first, is my next love. Um, but uh, we've always got stuff going on. Uh, just to plug another thing, uh, Coach Mack is uh, here at Blake Street Tavern every Friday from 4 to 6 p.m. on um, ESPN Radio 102.3. Um, we also have, uh, you know, anything CU related, whether it's um, an athletic event or like we do a lot of stuff with UCD. We do a lot of stuff with the health center, and we, you know we're we're not just a sports bar; we're an events venue. So um, we love everything CU, and um, you know. And the thing is, though, uh, we just don't do any business with CSU or Nebraska, <laughs> but especially CSU. I mean, I, they can go some other place. Awesome! Thank you very much, You're Chris. Welcome. Appreciate uh, it. Thank you. So this week, 0-2 start. We've got Fresno State on the deck. We luckily don't have the extra burden of a long, long road losing streak thanks to the Utah game because stop and think for a minute how that would feel right now for John Embry and for the players if, to be saddled with an 0-2 losing streak and then have the UCLA game followed by another road loss with Utah kind of still hanging over from last year. So we're fortunate that we got the win in Utah there. That's not all the talk about uh, heading into Fresno State is the road streak. The road streak, certainly you hear a lot of talk of they're not a good road team, but it's much better than they can't win on the road. We saw it happen against a Utah team that frankly is probably better than Fresno State by a decent margin uh, Fresno, than Fresno State is this year. Fresno is a team that's got a new head coach, um, just like Colorado State did and many of our the other teams we face this year will. Tim DeRuiter came in from Texas A&M, former Air Force guy, defensive guy, to take over for Pat Hill. Pat Hill had the uh, anytime, anywhere mantra, I beat the Buffs, and I think it was 02. 
uh, beat a lot of good teams back during his heyday. The team kind of fell off over the last few years. The defense really fell off. Uh, last, year, last year, I believe they, they won four or five games. Uh, they had some close losses. Actually, they had a lot of close losses. They got blown out by Boise, and they got blown out by one other, but they were close against Nevada. They were close against Ole Miss. Uh, so it was a better team than that record implied. This year, heading into the season, they were named uh, third in the Mountain West heading into uh, the preseason. Uh, there's a lot of talent on offense. We don't know as much about the defensive guys. You haven't heard their names, but you've got uh, Derek Carr, David Carr's younger brother. I'm sure he hears that all the time. Robbie Rouse, running back, who set career records for carries at Fresno State and is getting, I think, 50 or 60 yards away from setting the career yardage record. Devontae Adams and Isaiah Burst are both very talented young wide receivers. Um, they're one and one coming into this game. A, a win in the first game against Weber State, and then uh, a loss to Oregon. Um, the team, as, as Oregon started to not sub in whole units, but sub in and out a few guys, Fresno kind of closed that gap to make the, the loss a little bit more respectable. But in the first half, the Oregon offense was running all over them, as you'd expect an offense as good as Oregon to do to most, do to most teams. Um, in my eyes, I don't know that this is a, uh, a great matchup for a young Colorado defense. There's experience, and there's some good talent on that, that Fresno State line, uh, on that Fresno State team with a solid offensive line. So is our defense, especially on the road, do you see them being able to slow down that Fresno State offense? Why that's so hard to say is because what is Colorado's defense identity after two games? You have one game against Colorado State where they performed really well and were obviously not the reason they lost that football game. Um, and against Sacramento State, it was a completely different. Th this is a defense that couldn't s stop them to save their lives. So you mentioned the experience that Fresno State has on that side of the ball. So against, with, if Greg Henderson doesn't go this Saturday, you've got again for the second straight week, three true freshmen starting in the secondary. So uh, on paper, that does not sound very encouraging. Before the season, I thought this was going to be a pick 'em game. Obviously, it's not. Vegas had it at 17. What is it now? 14? 14, 14 and a half, yeah. Which sounds about right. Yeah, I think so, too. And, I, and you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see this, this Colorado team. Look back at both those games, Sacramento State and Colorado State. No one here is going to call, call those high-quality teams, but those were both games that as bad at Colorado played in a few different spots. We're really close to having two wins there. Uh, if you look back and, and change a few small things around, I'm not going to say cinch it up. Um, <laughs> But we, it's two games in. It looks bad. We don't know a whole lot about this Colorado team. The Colorado team has to get better as we go in. It's youth. It's inexperience. They'll get better as the season goes along. Granted, the competition gets significantly better as the season goes along. But we really don't know that much about Fresno, too. We're basing everything we know on them off of two games where they beat a FCS school in Weber State by about 20 points and where they lost to Oregon by 25 or so points off the top of my head. Uh, but a lot of those points came kind of in garbage time. We don't know a lot about Fresno State. We, to be quite honest, don't know a lot about how this Colorado team will perform, especially being on the road. Who knows? Anything can happen, right? It's college football. And another element to this game uh, that's intriguing, obviously, as you mentioned, Oregon ran up and down the field on Fresno State earlier at will. Well, this, this Fresno State defense, though, they rank 13th nationally in sacks right now. Uh, number one in the Mountain West, and they play a three-man front. So they're going to have a lot of different fronts that are going to show Colorado. They're going to blitz from a lot of different areas. So what, what do you need in a situation like that? You need great communication up front. Well, they're going to Fresno State, which has good fan support, and so it's going to be loud in there. Uh, Embry mentioned today it's going to be a rowdy environment. So how well those guys on, on the Colorado offensive line and communicating with the tight end and the fullback and, and quarterback and, and everybody in the backfield, that's going to be huge for this game because they're going to see a lot of different fronts from Fresno State. And it'll be interesting to see too what, what that, uh, you know, they always have the on the field temperatures as the game starts in. Well, the, the weather report is supposed to be 100 degrees uh, at game time and that's not on the field, that's in the Fresno area. You've got a big fullback in Christian Powell who, who got <laughs> a lot of carries against Sacramento State. Is there, could, can he wear down that Fresno State defense? Can we now start to get that running game going a little bit better and start to wear down a defense in a way that will allow either Jordan Webb or Connor Wood to have a little bit more time to uh, get the ball to his receivers. It's going to be uh, it's going to be something to pay attention to. When you talk about that 100 degree temperature, I have flashbacks of the Arizona State <laughs> Row game from a few years ago when they got off to the early lead and it looked like yeah. they were going to roll, and then a couple drop touchdown passes and the the heat started hitting them, and 
they they could not do anything in the second half and it became a rout so it'll be interesting to see how they adapt to, to the weather um, for 100 degree weather when they're used to obviously coming from Colorado so that's it is an interesting element of this game especially when you, you look and it's, it's the reverse of last season a little bit when you look at the way Colorado's performed on a half by half basis they've we've, we've, we've come out this year and, and performed better in the first half and then seemingly in both games kind of failed to adjust to what the other team is doing. They, they start strong and then the other team make adjust, makes adjustments and the Buffs don't. So if that heat becomes a factor, if, if the Buffs do begin to wear down, we're going to re really have to count on the conditioning and the strength and conditioning program there and hope that those guys are ready to go and that they're ready to really compete and make those adjustment, ju adjustments for the second half. So the other thing that a lot of people want to talk about, especially since we've got Adam uh, joining us on the show going forward, is, is recruiting. That's, uh, that's kind of your wheelhouse and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of fans are always looking forward toward the future, especially when you start out 0-2. Oh, and, and one question that most people have been asking, I'm hearing all the time, is will this start affect recruiting? Our recruiting class is going to fall apart. Is anyone going to be able, still want to come here? Now, that's obviously a very um, reactive response, but there's some merit to, to the question and wondering if that could be a factor. Have you heard anything from any of the recruits? Have you looked in, I mean, we've had a lot of bad seasons over the past few years. How much does that actually pay uh, of a factor does that pay in guys that are already committed and the guys that are being recruited currently? It's it's huge and uh, it's even bigger as you go deeper into a tenure with a coach. When a brand new coach takes over, they're not quite as worried about it because you got to build it up from the foundation. And so if you went like they won three games last year, it wasn't a big deal with recruiting because, hey, we broke the road losing streak, we're turning the corner, and hey, by the way, you can come in and you can play right away, which is a big selling point. Well, that early playing time pitch doesn't work as well if you've won three games and then two or three games the next year. You have to be showing some progress. Um, no one wants to think back to this time, but Dan Hawkins' second year, they went to a bowl game. And what happened? They had the 15th rated recruiting class in the country. Now, those guys didn't pan out the way they were expected to, but you're much better off consistently having a top 15 class than not. Yep. So you, you consistently look at the top 25 recruiting classes every year by and large, with a few exceptions, those are winning football programs, and it helps them sustain that success, so it kind of feeds each other. It's kind of the chicken and egg argument. Well, early on, all you can do is sell that early playing time, but that only works for so long. Uh, right now, they have 13 verbal commitments from the class of 2013. No matter what happens this season, I'm pretty confident they'll, keep, they'll retain most of those 13. I'd be very surprised if more than one or two decommits, no matter what happens. Um, so, but where it hurts you is rounding out the class, the next five guys that you're targeting. If you go to a bowl game this year, you might be able to pull in some late blue chippers that could really help the program going forward. And then even more so going into the 2014 class, because now with early recruiting, uh, the way it is now, you know, Colorado had 13 commitments before camp even started. And what was that based off? That was based off last year, the momentum of you know, finishing strong, winning two of your last three. It's, it's a new staff going into the second year. So uh, how they finish out this year will be huge towards next year's recruiting class. Um, I think that we have a lot of guys that are inexperienced and they're learning every game. And there's a lot of progress there, I think. Uh, I think the freshmen have actually been playing really well. And um, I think that throughout this season, every game, they're going to make a little bit more progress for sure. Um, I think just simple mistakes that we made. We just, one guy not doing their job, a few plays here and there that we wish we could get back. But uh, teams that we played, they played really well, and they capitalized on those mistakes. We can't take plays off, for sure. I think that we come out strong. Everyone's running to the ball. Like Coach said, we, he showed us the, uh, the first play of the game this last week, and it was like a team picture. Everyone's running to the ball. And the third series uh, seemed like there wasn't that, um, I guess, in intensity to run to the ball, I guess. We're transitioning a little bit from uh football but still sticking with with bat with are still sticking with recruiting we've got two new uh two new basketball commits to talk about both of them kind of came right after the buffs first two losses so it was this little ray of sunshine in the darkness of, of the start to the season for the bus but last week 
Talk a little bit about the first commit that Tad Boyle got this year. Jerron Hopkins uh, ranked as the 107th best prospect nationally. Um, he was listed as a point guard. I believe now he's listed as a shooting guard on Rivals. He's a combo guy. And he basically provides them with what they didn't get when Tyrone Wallace picked Cal last year. He was a Rivals 150 combo guard that CU really thought they were going to get for, for a little bit. He came onto campus and kind of hinted that he was going to commit to Colorado. That didn't end up happening. So um, Jerron Hopkins will come in and uh, he'll provide depth initially. Obviously they've got a couple really good guards right now in Spencer Dinwiddie and Askia Booker. And so uh, it, it continues Tad Boyle's streak of blue chippers here. And then the next commitment that they got kind of goes back to the other side of Tad Boyle recruiting where they find the three star that got overlooked a little bit and, and you hear all these things about Dustin Thomas, uh, the combo forward that just committed uh, the other day from Texarkana, Texas. Uh, my sources up at CU tell me if he played in the Dallas area, everybody would have been recruiting this kid. Six foot nine forward that shot 48% from three point range last year. Really get five steals a game, really good rebounding numbers. Um, I'm told that his uh, team never subbed him out. That's how valuable. They would go into his zone when he got tired just to give him a chance to catch his breath. So, I mean, the last forward they got from Texas turned out pretty yeah, good. So, we'll see. Take that again. <laughs> Uh, and he was district MVP, am I right? Correct. And then on, on uh, Hopkins, clear up the, the Arizona deal with me because I, my brother, I mentioned it on the site before, my brother's a wildcat, and I've seen on some of the, the Arizona sites, he's listed as having an offer, but I've also heard it's not, it wasn't really being uh, pursued more recently. It was Could he have committed to Arizona, or was that something where they kind of started to back off of him a little bit? Maybe early on, but yeah, you're correct. They Arizona backed off on him. Now, Jerron Hopkins had plenty of other schools oh, recruiting him. He did well on the, during the July evaluation period, and he's one of those recruits, if he doesn't sign early and some big schools don't get their top priority, they'd come after him hard. So yeah. if he didn't sign with Colorado early, there'd be a lot more competition for his signature. Well, with the issues that, uh, that have faced UCLA with, in their recruiting class in the offseason, uh, the bus, the sky is the limit in basketball seasons. As hard as the start to the football season has been, Basketball is just around the corner, and it's a very, very bright future for this season and beyond for Tad Boyle and that program. Uh, starting with this season, there's a, right out of the gate, there's the opener, and then they head right to Charleston for that tournament. And they've got the experience in Europe. Josh Scott looked great uh, in Europe. Uh, Eli Stalter looks like he could be a steal recruiting-wise. Um, I think by the time this video airs, we're hoping, because we've heard rumors and we've seen the the bus program try and get more Facebook likes on their page. There's, there's been rumors and rumblings of, of a potential bus madness, we're calling it, um, to really kick off the basketball season, which would just be monumental for this program. The fact that the, uh, the uh, administration is pushing this through and, and to really say, hey, we're, we're going to support this program and fans, if you fill that building, because if we do pull this off and we don't show, it's going to look bad on us, it's going to look bad on the university and the athletic department, and most importantly, it's going to let down those players. Like, for recruiting, this is absolutely huge. For the current players, this is absolutely huge. There's not a lot of schools in the, in the nation that pull off something like this or even attempt to. And, and if we do, if they do announce that we're going to move forward with something like that, we need to really knock this one out of the park. And, and I'm really excited about it. I don't know about you. I think it would be great. It's it's unbelievable the excitement around Colorado basketball. When I started covering that program, you go to the Coors Event Center, and there was not a more drab environment for college basketball. And I never envisioned them being able to create the type of environment that they have really the last three years. Jeff Bezdelik's last year as well. And it's, it's incredible how the community of Boulder and the fans have really rallied around that team. And I think it comes back to Tad Boyle and his ability in his desire to get out in the community and really sell that program. I mean, he gets it. No, he gets it. Now, this March Madness, uh, or I'm sorry, not March Madness, this uh, preseason madness event, um, he's, he said, I, I want to do this, but only if fans show up. And I think they've finally gotten to the point where fans will definitely show up. Well, as someone who didn't grow up in the Colorado or around the Colorado program, I, I've heard fans talk about kind of the glory days and, and the years where the bus were top 10, top five team in the nation. Uh, and the basketball program has really shown that the fans will be there. The fans will support that product when it gets on the field. We've got to support them. Uh, as they kind of struggle through these hard times, but the, the fans want to, want to really be there for the Buffalo's entire athletic program. Uh, I think that's 
that's about it for our first episode. Is there anything else that you want no, to add? No, no. It was fun, John. Absolutely. Well, thanks for joining us for the first uh, premiere episode of An Hour in the Buff. I'm John Woods for Adam Munster-Tiger. Thanks. Good night.